Noam Chomsky is widely considered to be the leading dissident intellectual in this country. His research and information over the years have proved irrefutable. In all his writings since the Vietnam War, Chomsky has never once retracted a single piece of information. Yet you seldom if ever see him debating the finest minds in Washington on any major networks. He's almost never invited on national public radio or even on public broadcasting, PBS. Undaunted, Chomsky goes on churning out books faster than any other political writer in this country. To have Chomsky's most recent information is like an empowerment boost for those in the struggle for justice. Well, today on Democracy Now!, we want to bring you one of Noam Chomsky's most recent talks on the fairy tale of the booming economy in this country. The talk is entitled, Whose World Order? Conflicting Visions. He gave it at Purdue University just a few weeks ago. I want to say some things about uh, the way the world is, the way we're taught the world is, uh, and then about the way most people experience the world uh, here and even more so in countries that aren't as rich and uh, full of advantages as this one, uh, and then uh, talk about why, uh, how come it turn, things turn out like this, and towards the end, uh, what are some of the plans that are now being laid, uh, mostly in secrecy, uh, to enhance a process which is quite injurious to the large majority of the people of the United States and even more so elsewhere, which is why they're kept secret. Uh, well, how is the world presented to us? We don't have to spend much time on this because you hear it uh, all day and uh, every day. Uh, I'll just take one example from the New York Times newspaper of record, uh, a lead story in the Sunday Times last week. Uh, the headline is by one of their leading uh, correspondents. Uh, the headline reads, America is prosperous uh, and smug. Uh, Americans, goes on to say, Americans have boundless confidence, expectations of unlimited economic success. Uh, they're living in the happy glow of an American boom, a fairy tale U.S. expansion since 1991 uh, under the direction of the man who the international financial press christens uh, the saintly Alan Greenspan uh, with due <laughs> reverence. Uh, well, that's sort of that's the way things are supposed to be. Okay, you can ask yourself whether they are. Uh, let's have a look at the way they are, uh, beginning with the happy glow of the American boom and the fairy tale exp expansion. Well, it certainly has been a fairy tale for some sectors of the population, namely the business world. Uh, in fact, the uh, story that I just quoted actually gives one example of the fairy tale economy, namely the stock market. Uh, and it's true that asset inflation is going through the roof and concerning plenty of economists. Uh, and that's a real benefit to the 1% uh, of the population who own, uh, of households who own half the stock, uh, roughly comparable figures for other assets, or the, even the top 10% who own about 90% of them. Uh, if you throw in pension funds, you get a little redistribution of figures among the top fifth uh, for the rest of the population, it's essentially irrelevant. It's also pretty much irrelevant for the economy. That's another story. Uh, but for them, it's certainly been a fairy tale, uh, especially the top 1%. Uh, in fact, it's been a fairy tale for the business world altogether. Uh, so year after year, you have reports of uh, what they call a dazzling, uh, stupendous uh, profit growth, uh, breaking all records, uh, uh, the problems, the read Business Week, you find out that the problems that the business world faces are uh, uh, things like what to do with all that cash as surging profits are overflowing the co coffers of corporate America uh, with liquid assets of non-financial institutions, uh, corporations uh, reaching a staggering uh, two-thirds of a trillion dollars, which are causing, which is causing vexing problems for Boeing and Intel and General Electric and other suffering corporations, uh, for them, undoubtedly, it's a fairy tale. Uh, turning, looking at the rest of us, uh, the fairy tale expansion since 1991 is, in fact, the weakest recovery of the post-war period, post-Second World War period. It's even below the quite anemic uh, growth rates of the 1980s and the 1970s, and well below the historical average since the Civil War in fact, the worst one on record. 
Uh, that's the fairy tale growth rate. Uh, if you look at per capita economic growth, uh, and you rank the United States among the OECD countries, the 29 rich countries, uh, it's about average, actually slightly below average in per capita economic growth in the 90s. Uh, picked up a little the last couple of quarters, but in general, not only slow, unusually slow growth, but unusually slow growth of productivity, which is a uh, predictor for the future. Uh, that's the fairy tale economy. Uh, so how come, we, it does raise a question, how could we have uh, a uh, you know, stupendous profit growth uh, when the fairy tale expansion uh, is the weakest uh, since World War II? Well, there's actually a pretty simple answer to that. Uh, for approximately two-thirds of the population, uh, hourly wages have either stagnated or declined in the last 20 years. Uh, 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 working hours are going up. Uh, wages are going down. Uh, the average wage is probably 15% lower than it was in the mid-70s. Uh, Entry-level wages, first job. Uh, they collapsed during the 1980s. It went down by about 30 uh, percent. You read and you know, economists tell you, well, this is only unskilled workers, but then small footnote, uh, the definition of unskilled workers is about 75 percent of the workforce. Uh, the, uh, in the late 1980s, uh, which was a period of weak recovery, better than this one, but still some kind of recovery, uh, during the latter half of the 1980s, uh, hunger in the United States uh, went up by 50 percent, uh, reached 30 million people. Uh, the, uh, you go back to around 1980, the United States was more or less um, average, in a, like other industrial countries, by measures like, um, say, child poverty or malnutrition, uh, uh, infant mortality, uh, uh, percentage of the population in prison. Uh, inequality, other standard quality of life measures. Uh, after, by the end of the 1980s, it was far in the lead, and it's going still farther in the lead by such measures, if lead is the right word. Uh, the, uh, uh, during the 1980s, industrial accidents, accidents on the job, uh, doubled. Uh, illegal firing of uh, union organizers tripled in the 1980s along with a whole host of other violations of labor laws, uh, the Reagan administration, in effect, informed the business world that it simply wasn't going to inform, enforce the laws. They could be on the books if you want, but they weren't going to enforce them. And advantage was taken of that. Again, you can read about it in Business Week, which described it quite accurately. That's continuing under Clinton. That's a big factor uh, in the uh, rising inequality, uh, in the attack on wages, uh, on uh, 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 incomes, uh, uh, and in fact, it's kind of recognized in the business pages of the New York Times, not the, you know, the lead stories of the kind they read, where they describe what they call a treadmill economy, in which most people are going nowhere fast, uh, with quite poor prospects uh, because of such factors as unusually low productivity growth, uh, low entry-level wages, and so on. Well, what about the boundless confidence of the uh, smug, prosperous Americans? Well, you can learn about that from the New York Times, too. There's another front page story uh, with the title, uh, Rehabilitation of Mourning in America. You know, Mourning in America was the slogan that Reagan's speechwriters gave him when he's riding off into the sunset and imitating John Wayne or something. Uh, so now there's a rehabilitation of mourning in America. Uh, and the story goes on to explain that things are really looking up, you know, contrary to the doomsayers with all their boring statistics about hungry children and uh, you know, wage decline and all that kind of nonsense. Uh, things are the story does concede that I'm quoting it now. Things are looking up mostly for the well-off and successful. Uh, people like Jerry Jasinowski, who's the head of the National Association of Manufacturers, Factors, who's quoted liberally right through the story, like the main person quoted. But then it says, the story says, it's not just the well off and successful, even the millions who are, I'm quoting, even, million, even the millions who are suffering appear to be helping reestablish what Mr. Jasinowski considers the right priorities uh, as their expectations have diminished. Uh, so they're pretty well off too. 
Uh, of course, the right priorities for the business world are a little different. I mean, there they are surging profits, overflowing the coffers of cor corporate America and causing vexing problems and so on. Uh, the story quotes the head of the University of Michigan Research Center, which is the main center that kind of monitors public, opi public opinion regularly. He says, uh, it's like people are saying, uh, I'm not earning enough to get by, but it's not as bad as it could be. Uh, well, before the Reagan-Clinton <coughs> economic miracle, people had old-fashioned ideas about getting by. Uh, so it's morning in America. Americans are prosperous and smug with uh, you know, boundless confidence and so on. Uh, what is all this about? Uh, well, it actually makes perfect sense if you understand how to read English. You have to understand that the word Americans doesn't refer to Americans. Uh, Americans re refers to the constituency of uh, the New York Times, uh, the people who they meet in elegant restaurants and executive suites and editorial offices and so on. That's Americans, and they're prosperous and smug, and they have boundless expectations, and for them it's a fairy tale economy. And if these, there's other sort of two-legged creatures out there, uh, they have to establish the right priorities which are, well, you know, could be worse, and, you know, maybe I'm not getting by, but uh, don't, just don't have any expectations, even as things get worse and worse. Uh, that's what's called a healthy economy, a fairy tale economy, and from a certain point of view, it is. Uh, let's take a look at the saintly Alan Greenspan, who presided over the fairy tale economy in the 1990s. Uh, he testified about it to the Senate Banking Committee about a year ago. He was very proud of his achievement. And he explained it. Uh, he attributed the miracle to what he called greater worker insecurity, meaning workers are intimidated. Uh, they're afraid to ask for a living wage or for benefits. Uh, and that's a good thing. That contributes to what's called the health of the economy. That's it. Health of the economy is a term kind of like Americans. It doesn't mean what the words seem to indicate. Uh, it's a technical term uh, which refers to uh, uh, making sure the Americans are smug and prosperous, whatever <laughs> happens to the population. Uh, health of the economy is a term that's uncorrelated with the health of the economy, even the you know literal health of the population. Uh, so that's these are good things. You know that's what we should hope for. So naturally we're proud. Workers are nice and intimidated, and so on. Uh, the economic report of the president, which comes out every year. Uh, uh, described pretty much the same things in sort of more muted terms. Now, they also took pride, the Clinton administration took pride in the fairy tale boom, uh, and they attributed it to significant wage restraint, uh, which they say results from changes in labor market institutions and practices, uh, which are not detailed, but they include things like, for example, not enforcing the laws. Uh, on uh, about uh, illegal strike strike breaking or not enforcing uh, OSHA regulations, safety and health regulations, which accounts for the sharp rise in industrial accidents and so on. Uh, so they that's change in uh, labor market institutions and practices. Uh, there are other changes. Uh, the United States. Uh, one of the major ones is uh, the use of uh, what are called permanent replacement workers, which is a step worse than strike breakers. Uh, that's impermissible in any industrial country. Uh, in fact, the United States has been censured by the International Labor Organization uh, for resorting to this pra practice. You should realize that the ILO very rarely criticizes its main funders. Uh, so this was quite unusual. Uh, when the US was censured, I think it was 1992, uh, there were two countries, two industrial countries, that allowed permanent replacement workers, uh, the United States and South Africa. I think South Africa is now off the boat with the unfortunate changes that have taken place there in the last couple of years. Uh, so that means the United States is probably alone in this respect, which wouldn't be too surprising. Uh, the United States also has the worst record in uh, Europe and the Western Hemisphere uh, in ratifying uh, ILO labor conventions, conventions on labor rights. 
Uh, if you're really a stickler, you ought to catch me on that. It actually has the third worst record. Uh, Lithuania. You're listening to Professor Noam Chomsky of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology giving a recent speech at Purdue University in Fort Wayne, Indiana. We'll come back to him in just a minute here on Pacifica Radio's Democracy Now! As we continue with the speech of Professor Noam Chomsky, given just a few weeks ago at Purdue University in Fort Wayne, Indiana, Noam Chomsky, Professor of Linguistics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Now you take a look at the Caterpillar strike that, that just ended with a big defeat for working people. Uh, Caterpillar did resort to the permanent replacement workers option, but also to other things. Uh, Caterpillar, like other major corporations, other Americans, uh, in the special sense of the press, uh, Caterpillar enjoyed dazzling profits. Uh, It was part of the huge profit boom, and it used the profits uh, not for economic growth, but for excess production, for creation of excess capacity abroad. Uh, it doesn't contribute to you know, economic health in the ordinary sense, uh, but it does contribute to class warfare, and it makes good sense for that reason. If you have excess capacity abroad, then if working people in Illinois strike, uh, you can fill, your, you know, uh, uh, fill the orders for your markets by using super-exploited cheap labor abroad that you've uh, got available thanks to the excess capacity that you've created a result of the dazzling profits. Uh, So that's a good way of attacking American workers, Uh, and that, again, contributes to the health of the economy uh, and the fairy tale boom and so on. Uh, The the fact, the general fact, is that capital is extremely mobile now. It wasn't always. I'll come back to why it is so mobile, Uh, but labor obviously isn't. Uh, Furthermore, the links among working people are extremely weak. Uh, there have been major attacks on the unions, even within countries, but the international links are weak, and uh, to confront coordinated, concentrated, tyrannical structures with enormous resources uh, is very difficult, particularly when they're backed by powerful states uh, and by secret, huge secret bureaucracies like the IMF, which are devoted to their interests and so on. It's an unequal struggle, uh, and uh, uh, if unless it is equalized and changed, uh, the future, at least for democracy and human rights, doesn't look so great. Uh, Another change uh, in labor market institutions and practices uh, results from the trade agreements, the mislabeled free trade agreements. Uh, So it takes a NAFTA. Uh, The uh, uh, NAFTA is is an investor rights agreement, it's not a free trade agreement. Uh, it has some wording about labor rights and environmental rights, but they're basically toothless. Uh, they were put in to get people to shut up. Uh, the, uh, but they don't, they're not completely vacuous. Uh, under NAFTA rules, it's possible for workers to uh, bring complaints about uh, illegal labor practices. And in fact, some did so. Telecommunication workers brought a complaint under NAFTA. They actually won, but the corporation got a tap on the wrist a couple of years later, it didn't amount to anything. Uh, But one side effect of it was that there was a study done under NAFTA rules uh, about uh, the role of uh, NAFTA in uh, uh, strike breaking in the United States. It was done by a labor historian uh, at Cornell University, Kate Bronfenbrenner, published under NAFTA, suppressed by the Clinton administration, but released by Canada and Mexico. Uh, uh, Her conclusion is that uh, Half, I think the Clinton administration finally released it after a delay, not that you'd know anything about it by you know, reading the press. Uh, according to her study, about half of, uh, half of organizing efforts since NAFTA uh, have been disrupted by threats to transfer. Uh, that it means things like putting up a, you know, putting a trailer outside a plant where people are trying to organize with a sign that says, uh, you know, Mexican transfer job or something like that. Uh, And these uh, threats are not idle. Uh, When organizing efforts nevertheless succeed, uh, there have been uh, uh, closures uh, at triple the rate, the pre-NAFTA rate. So meaningful threats. Uh, Of course, it's all illegal. Uh, All such efforts at strike breaking are illegal, but remember that's a technicality uh, since the Reagan administration and now the Clinton administration have essentially informed the business world that you don't have to worry about laws because we're not going to enforce them. Crime pays, in other words, with state protection. 
Well, that's a sample of some of the benign changes in labor market institutions and practices that leads to significant wage restraint uh, and gives us a fairy tale economy for Americans who are smug and prosperous. Uh, all I have to do is translate the words a little and uh, you go from propaganda to reality quite easily. Uh, the saintly Allen uh, has also, also gives public talks. He gave one recently to the uh, newspaper editors uh, meeting in the United States. Interesting talk worth reading. Uh, it's full of passionate rhetoric about the miracles of the market, uh, the wonders that are brought about by consumer choice and all these magnificent things. And he even gave examples, which is nice. Uh, his examples are the internet, computers, information processing, satellites, and transistors, a couple of others. Now, those are kind of interesting examples of the miracles of the market and consumer choice, because as any, even the most ignorant economist knows, those are textbook examples of creativity and production in the state sector, in the public sector, uh, picked up later by the business world, given to them as gifts after the work's been done. Uh, so take, say, uh, the internet, which is you know, a stellar example. I mean, that was developed for 30 years uh, within the Pentagon uh, and then the National Science Foundation. And just a couple of years or two ago, it was handed over to private corporations. So now, you know, Bill Gates is real interested in the Internet. Uh, for the 30 years that it was being developed, uh, private business had no interest. Gates wouldn't even go to a conference on the Internet two or three years ago. Uh, I have to say, he's, he is honest about it. Uh, he has attributed his success to his ability to, I'm quoting him, uh, to embrace and expand the ideas of others, uh, most of which come from your pocketbook, incidentally. Uh, the Internet is, a, is almost a classic example. Uh, take computers, you know, kind of the core of a modern industrial society. Uh, same story. Uh, in the 1950s, they were unmarketable. So the public paid for, their, for the research and development uh, under the cover of an air defense system and other such things. Uh, when, they, when they advanced to the point where you could sell them, uh, they were handed over to private corporations, some of them spin-offs from the uh, military project. Uh, that's why IBM isn't making typewriters anymore and so on for a whole bunch of others. Uh, the, uh, uh, but the public contribution remained. Uh, and in the 1980s, particularly, it went up uh, with new, you know, uh, new developments in uh, advanced computer technology and so on. Uh, that's computers. It's the same story with information processing, uh, satellites, too obvious to comment. Uh, the one example that he mentioned that uh, where you could claim that there's a private sector contribution in the crucial research and development uh, stage is transistors. Uh, so that one's worth looking at. The others aren't even a joke. Uh, uh, this one is at least a joke, which is what it is. Uh, transistors were, in fact, uh, invented in, uh, in a private a laboratory, a Bell Labs in 1947. Uh, but what was the role of the market and consumer choice in that? Uh, well, the answer is zero, uh, because uh, Bell Labs was the uh, laboratory of AT&T, which was a government-supported monopoly. So there's no consumer choice and no market. Uh, the, uh, uh, since it was a monopoly, it was able to charge monopoly prices, which is in effect a tax on the public. And taxing the public, through taxing the public, it was able to establish a very good laboratory. Bell Labs was a fine lab where they invented uh, transistors and solar cells and uh, information theory and radio astronomy, all kinds of work. Uh, it was a great lab. I used to go there in the 50s. Uh, as soon as the uh, monopoly was broken, Bell Labs went down the tube uh, because the public wasn't paying for it anymore. Uh, so no more Bell Labs. Uh, but it's true that in 1947, uh, a government-supported monopoly was able to uh, use indirect taxation uh, to uh, develop transistors. However, that's not the end of the story. Uh, transistors were, the development of transistors was based on wartime technology, technology developed during the war again, at public expense. Uh, furthermore, when transistors were developed, there was nothing much to do with them. Uh, so the government stepped in, meaning you stepped in, or your parents, or whatever, 
uh, and paid for transistor research and development. Uh, the procurement, uh, the government procurement, was the total use of transistors uh, in the early crucial years when the research and designs and, so, and production techniques and so on were developed. In fact, 10 years after they were invented, uh, the Western Electric Company, which is Bell's supply, AT&T supplier, uh, they were producing, I think, a couple hundred thousand transistors, and 100% of them were for the government market. Uh, so that's uh, the one example which maybe rises to the level of a joke uh, of uh, the miracles of the market and consumer choice. Now, these are the St. Lee Allen's examples. I didn't pick them. Uh, but in fact, again, as even the most ignorant economist must know, uh, certainly the business world knows, uh, just about every dynamic sector of the U.S. economy works that way, uh, whether it's uh, electronics or uh, pharmaceuticals or biotechnology or whatever. Uh, there's an enormous public component uh, for the research and development stage and for uh, absorption of risk. Uh, the story is that uh, the way you know, the miracles of the market are supposed to work, uh, the cost and risk are socialized. They're the public's responsibility. Uh, private, uh, there is a private component, namely profit and power are privatized. Uh, that's really existing markets. Uh, and it's not just the United States, it's every industrial society, and it's not new. It goes back to the origins of the Industrial Revolution. It's what you might call really existing market theory. Uh, and uh, these examples are, are good ones. Uh, well, of course, the business world thinks this is a terrific arrangement. Uh, why shouldn't they? Uh, uh, when you look at particular cases, you get a, a clearer sense of the way it works. Uh, so take, say, the leaders of the conservative uh, revolution in Congress. Uh, the leader in the House is Newt Gingrich, who's uh, full of uh, eloquent uh, rhetoric about the work ethic and making sure people get off this cycle of dependency and, you know, seven-year-old children have to know that nobody's going to give you a gift and that kind of business. Uh, he also, year after year, uh, keeps the record for bringing federal subsidies to his rich constituents in Cobb County, Georgia, suburb of Atlanta, happens to be a region where the state role in the economy, government role, meaning public role, is unusually extensive, uh, but uh, he's champion. Uh, again, to be precise, he's third. Uh, Arlington, Virginia, which is part of Washington, gets more federal subsidies. That's where the Pentagon is and places like that. Uh, and Brevard County, Florida, which is the home of the Kennedy Space Center, uh, that gets more public subsidies. But apart from them, the Gingrich year after year is the record for suburban uh, districts. Uh, the main employer in his district is that noted uh, uh, exponent of free markets, uh, Lockheed Martin, uh, a publicly subsidized corporation. Uh, in fact, every um, uh, American household, the average household, pays about a, now about a $200, year, $200 a year Lockheed Martin tax uh, to make sure that the rich folk down there don't break the cycle of dependency. Uh, even with the public, uh, public uh, support, uh, Lockheed practically it was going to went broke uh, in the early 70s. So it was rescued by a $250 million bailout by the Nixon administration. It was that action that led Senator Proxmire to uh, coin the phrase corporate welfare. Well, OK, that's uh, the leader of uh, the conservative revolution in the House. Uh, how about the leader in the Senate, uh, Trent Lott, Senate Republican leader? Uh, I'll just quote the uh, state and quite proper uh, Financial Times, the leading financial journal in the world from London, uh, had a headline uh, reading, Most Successful Pork Producer of 1997. Uh, then goes on to the story about Trent Lott. Uh, it continues like this. Uh, if you take, say, the CEO of Citicorp, uh, Walter Riston, the man who more or less invented uh, you know, huge loans to the third world, which led to the third world debt crisis and so on. He's a great exponent of the free market and laissez-faire, uh, and very proud of the fact that markets can now set social policy. They're so powerful, so you don't have to worry about democratic states anymore. On the other hand, when the whole thing went bust in 1982, uh, he was quite happy to be bailed out by the public. Uh, when the third world debts were socialized and the commercial banks were essentially paid off in various indirect ways by 
uh, by taxpayers and, of course, by the victims who paid for it. Uh, so the laissez-faire doctrine disappeared. There's a little more to that story. Uh, Riston's uh, entrepreneurial techniques uh, included, uh, in fact, a large part of the bank's profits were based on uh, fraudulent uh, schemes worked out in Brazil, uh, which were declared illegal by the Internal Revenue Service. Uh, but that was no big problem. The IRS was overruled by William Simon, another great believer in the free market. Uh, he was then Secretary of the Treasury, and he shortly after resigned and joined the board of directors of Citicorp. Uh, well, that's uh, the way the real world works. Uh, but uh, the, uh, that's, uh, on the other hand, there's the picture world that you're taught about. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, as I say, there's nothing really new about this, but there are changes. Uh, a big, it goes way back in the beginning of American history and England before it, uh, but there, was, there, there have been changes. There was a major change around the Second World War, uh, the Depression and the Second World War. Uh, the Depression of the 1930s uh, made it very clear uh, to anyone who had any lingering illusions about the matter that there's no conceivable possibility for free market capitalism to work. I mean, nobody really believed it much anyway, uh, but that put an end to it. Uh, the uh, New Deal measures took some of the edge off the Depression, but not very much. I mean, they made people feel better and that sort of thing, but uh, the effects were about the same. There was not much difference in 1939 and 1929. Uh, what did cure the Depression was the war. Uh, the war created a command economy or a semi-command economy. Uh, market principles were put to the side. Uh, corporate executives flocked to Washington and organized a state-controlled economy, uh, which was extremely successful. Uh, American industrial production tripled, depression over, uh, resources were allocated, wages and prices, mainly wages, were controlled. Uh, and it was an extremely eff effective, and it taught lessons. In particular, it taught lessons to the guys who ran the economy. They didn't have to read about Keynes and textbooks. They had just seen it. Uh, here was a organized state-controlled economy, which had plenty of private profit. So Boeing Corporation, for example, uh, took off, you know, doing its patriotic duty by uh, making huge profits uh, after it barely survived before. Uh, but... Uh, 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 and and the, the lesson was very clear, and it was understood. Uh, it was assumed almost universally by businessmen, by economists and others, that the country was going to sink right back into a recession uh, after the war, unless the government stepped in. Uh, and if you read, go back and read the business press in those days, you know, Fortune, uh, Business Week, and so on, uh, they were pretty frank about it. Uh, so Fortune explained that uh, uh, high-tech industry I'm quoting, cannot, they were talking about aeronautical industry, but then they generalized to all high-tech industry, cannot survive in a competitive, unsubsidized, free enterprise economy. Noam Chomsky, professor of linguistics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and so much more, well-known political critic, America's leading dissident.